Little Lost Girl is the latest book from Casey Watson, and I was so looking forward to this. I've read over 100 foster care memoirs. Casey Watson is one of my favourites, and this was released on the Thursday before the Easter weekend, so I thought, fantastic, I will take whatever time I want to read this, and if that's in one sitting or two sittings, as is usually the case, so be it. Unfortunately, it actually took me four days to read this. Well, four evenings. And that's because I just found that the first half wasn't that interesting. And there were a couple of other things I actually had a bit of an issue with. It's really not perfect. It's not up to the usual quality of a Casey Watson book. Initially, this will be spoiler free. But then there are a couple of things I want to mention in a little bit of detail. So I will give a spoiler warning when I get there. Because I still do ultimately recommend this. And the first thing I want to say, and then I'll get it out of the way, is that it does include a lot of very long, unnecessarily long-winded sentences. I kind of expected that. We do get that with Casey Watson books. But there are also a lot of grammatical issues. Nothing so severe that I couldn't read the book. I have a very low threshold for grammatical errors in books. So I guess that's kind of a good thing that they were issues with grammar, but not enough to stop me from reading it. But it's also just worth bearing in mind that a decent editor could have ironed that out pretty easily. So it's a bit irritating, but not the end of the world. The narrative itself is okay. The main narrative is not the most interesting. The main focus is a little girl called Emily. And I will, of course, talk more about her in a moment. But Casey also does some respite care throughout the story. So we get a couple of other children and one 18-year-old to mix things up a little bit. And I think that's really, really important to keep things at least a little bit interesting because Amelie's story is, for the most part, not as fascinating as I feel it should have been. Amelie is a six-year-old girl who comes to stay with Casey after her mother tried to burn down her home. And obviously this is awful. It's a terrible situation. Her mother is now in a mental health facility. She's got a, a long history of mental health problems and she's getting the help she needs, which is brilliant. Unfortunately, this is not great for Amelie. But it hasn't, it hasn't affected Amelie at all, at least not now. Maybe in the future she will start to show signs of it affecting her. But at the time of this story, she's just a very happy, excitable child. She's very pleasant, very easy to get on with. She doesn't really do anything wrong. She talks a little bit like a, a baby. She does baby talk sometimes, but really only a couple of times in the book as well. It doesn't really manifest that frequently. So it's not as if we can even heavily focus on that. And that part of the story is just really not interesting. Obviously, I'm glad that Amelie's a happy child. That's brilliant. I'm glad that the problems she's faced haven't really affected her much. The only way they have affected her is that her mother has told her that the bad men are watching her from all of the security cameras as part of her mother's mental health problems, she thinks that there are people out to get her, that there are literal bugs in technology. And this has obviously been very difficult to live with, but for Emily, it's just part and parcel. It's the norm. So it's not something she's necessarily particularly stressed about. She's not awake at night worrying about it, which again, I'm glad I don't want her to be doing that. But it's again, not that interesting. It's a good lesson in how you need to be careful with what you say around children, because she's obviously adopting all of her mother's deep anxieties, and I think anxiety is putting it mildly. But at the same time, at this stage, it's not really affecting Emily. It's just information she's taken as fact. With a spoiler warning in a little bit, I will talk more about Emily and what happens with her story and my thoughts on that. But very briefly, as I said, we also get some respite care in this, which I think was really essential because... Emily's story, for the most part, although she's a very pleasant child, is not the most fascinating. It, it is at times, but not enough for it to sustain the entire story on its own without interjections from other characters. And of course, I say characters because these are based on truth, but heavily modified to protect identities. And there are a couple of children that Casey looks after for a couple of days, and then she does respite care for an 18-year-old. Uh, it's a mother and baby placement. And that, I thought, was really interesting. I found that part of it to be frustrating in a way that was, you know, engaging and, and easy to want to read more about. I won't say too much more about that, but again, I will with a spoiler warning in a moment. So it's not 
a bad read as such. Yes, the grammatical errors are irritating, particularly as they're all they're all minor grammatical errors, but a good editor could have caught those quite easily. But aside from that, the story flows well enough. There are a few things that irritated me I'll talk about in a moment. But in general, it wasn't a badly written narrative. The pacing was fine. The characters were well written, even if they were not the most fascinating. Sometimes I did get a good sense of who they were, and that was absolutely fine. I could paint a clear picture in my mind of what was going on. So in general, it's not a bad book, but it's also not perfect. It's not the most fascinating. And the bits that were interesting didn't play out in a way that I think was satisfying to read. And I'll talk more about that in a moment. So I do recommend it if you're a fan of Casey Watson's books. But I will say, don't make it the first one you read. If you've never read anything from Casey Watson before, please don't make this the first one. Unless you're particularly interested in stories from around COVID, this does actually take place kind of at the beginning of lockdown, maybe middle of lockdown, and then towards that first Christmas. And I was a bit surprised by that because this is, if we can believe this, four years ago now, and it's taken four years to release this. I don't want to compare this to other books, but there are other foster care memoirs that were released shortly after COVID, very shortly after COVID, that dealt with what it's like to be a child in care during COVID. And I think they're much better at reading about childcare during COVID than this one is. So this isn't going to give you a good sense, really, of what it would be like to be in foster care during COVID. There are better examples, but it's still relatively interesting from that perspective. And I guess one could argue so much time has passed that it's maybe not as raw. Maybe it's a little bit easier to read about COVID now because we're not living in it. I don't know. But either way, it's not a bad book. I didn't mind it, but it took me probably twice as long as it does to read the usual Casey Watson book, which suggests to me that it definitely wasn't as gripping or as compelling as I would have liked. So I will now, with a spoiler warning, discuss a couple of things that I really didn't like about this and it really irritated me. I'm mentioning this just in case you feel the same way, you're not alone. So spoilers from now. And what I will say, there are two other things I want to mention, but very briefly, I found the ending to be very, very, very rushed because I wanted to know more about the settling in process and what it's like to have this kinship care. Now, as I said, I have actually read over 100 foster care memoirs at this point, so I'm, I have a general idea of what the process for kinship care is like. But if you haven't read anything about it before, this would have been a really brilliant opportunity to provide the reader with some interesting details because the story itself isn't that fascinating. So it could have been a good opportunity to focus instead on the processes because Emily ends up going to stay with her aunt Robin and it's a much quicker process for kinship care. Kinship care being when a relative of uh, the child looks after them, but they still have to go through a process with social services. They don't just hand the child over, but it's not as complex as the adoption process. And this would have been a really brilliant opportunity to look at the steps, how long it took, what each step was like for the child. And we do get a tiny glimpse of that when they go to the seaside, but that's basically it. And I think it was a really missed opportunity to go into some more detail, especially as the ending felt really rushed. So that's something that could have been done better. Now I will tell you two things that frustrated me to no end. Now, nobody is perfect, but if you're going to say that you did certain things and then not reflect on the fact that those were bad decisions, it doesn't make you look very good. And there are two occasions when Casey did things that really annoyed me. And the first one is when she had to follow the mother and baby at all times. The mother was not allowed to be on her own with the baby. And Casey goes to the supermarket with her. This is COVID. We had social distancing. We had to queue. This was around the time when only one person from each household was allowed to go into the store, uh, if you can remember that. And the mother and baby step forward and Casey approaches and the security guard says no. And fair enough, that's his job, but he wasn't very nice about it. And she said, I work for social services. I need to be with this mother and baby. And he said something to the effect of, I don't see your badge, which is not exactly a nice, polite thing to say. And Casey said, well, to us, the reader, she said that she did have her, her pass on her that said she worked for social services, but she wasn't going to show it to him. 
And that's so irresponsible. All she had to do was show that pass so she could supervise that mother and baby placement. And instead, she didn't because, what, she wasn't going to give him the satisfaction of being proven wrong? I don't know. But she should have shown that pass because she had a duty to look after that mother and baby. And because she didn't do that, that mother was able to... Well, I don't know if she stole vodka or bought vodka. It wasn't completely clear. But I'll get back to that in a moment. But she was able to obtain that vodka and then later on drink it. But if Casey had just shown her pass, that could have been avoided. Very irresponsible, but she never reflected on that being irresponsible. What I was about to say is that it wasn't clear if she bought or stole the vodka. I thought she'd bought it. But then I was reflecting on that. And I was thinking, well, why would she need to take the baby to the shop if she was going to buy it anyway? She could have gone to the shop by herself and bought it without needing Casey and the baby to come along. So that just didn't make a lot of sense to me. The other thing that really annoyed me, but it was also very well written at the time, is that Kelly phoned Casey in the middle of the night. Now, this is kind of hard to believe because the nurse wrote down Casey's phone number on a post-it and Kelly just so happened to see this going in the bin on the very same day or around the same time that another resident came in and managed to sneak in a mobile phone. It's a little bit too coincidental, but if it did happen, so be it. But Kelly phones up Casey in the middle of the night and it is a phone call that is very terrifying. It's very well written. If I would received that phone call, I would be scared. And Casey just put her phone on silent afterwards. And in the morning, she said, oh, but maybe she's escaped. Okay, well, if you thought a woman with mental health problems has escaped the hospital, why did you just put your phone on silent and go back to sleep? That's so irresponsible. If she had the number of the facility where Kelly was staying, I can't remember if she knew the name of the hospital, but if she did, she should have phoned the hospital. If she didn't, she should have phoned the out-of-duty social work at the very least to say, look, I've just got this phone call. One, do you have the name of the hospital so you can tell them? And two, if she has escaped, is it a danger for Amelie? And instead, she just put her phone on silent and went back to sleep. And again, maybe in her sleepiness, she would have done that. But at the same time, there was no reflection on this was not the way to handle this situation. And I thought that that was so irresponsible. And I felt a little bit sick with the thought that if I'd if I'd been in Kelly's position and I'd phoned somebody, granted she was calling her names and being horrible to her, but if I'd been in a mental health situation like that, and let's say I had escaped this hospital, which is, is hopefully not likely, and then the person on the other end just went, oh, maybe she's escaped. I'll put my phone on silent and go to sleep. That's disgusting. So there were definitely some things in this that I, I was really, really frustrated by. And as I said, nobody's perfect. If there was that reflection on this isn't how I should have handled it, that would have been totally okay. But that never came across. That was never explained in that way. So there are definitely things in this that are not great. And then you throw in the pretty mundane story. That phone call was the most dramatic thing that happened. And then you put in the bad grammar as well. It's just not the most pleasant read. But as I said, if you're a Casey Watson fan, definitely do give it a read. But if you've never read any Casey Watson before, please don't make this the first one to start with. I don't think Little Girl Lost is up to the usual quality.